Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to Freedom Fellowship Church. A very unique opportunity we have to get God's word out to the nations as we are commanded to in Scripture. So I'm thankful that you've uh, tuned in here. We'll have some worship a little later. We're going to pray in a minute, but I got to tell you, um, when I was on my way to church this morning, um, I saw this big truck pass in front of me, and on the side, it said big letters, flash. I'm going, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. So I've got to read 1 Corinthians 15, a couple scriptures for you real quick before we open. Uh, Verse 51 in 1 Corinthians 15 says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. So let's open in prayer today. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for those who are tuning in to hear. I pray you'd touch each person, strengthen their faith, encourage their hearts, and uh, give them hope. Remind them of um, the hope that we have in you, Jesus. And may you be glorified today. And we pray for everyone's health and safety during this unprecedented time we're here, we're having here in America and around the world. And uh, Lord, we lift up our leaders to you, give them wisdom, uh, give them strength, keep them healthy and safe and rested so that they can guide us through these times. Uh, we pray for our government leaders, give them wisdom, O oh God, for all the decisions they're making to stop this virus and contain it. Work on our local leaders, Lord, give them wisdom in all their decisions. And our spiritual leaders, Lord, our pastors, Father, in Jesus' name, um, help us to encourage the faith of people to equip the saints during this time. And our medical leaders, Lord, the medical community, those who are working in hospitals and urgent care centers and elsewhere, Lord, protect them in Jesus' name and give them wisdom, Father, and insight also, the scientific community, how to stop the virus and get what we need. Um, Also give our civic leaders, uh, inspiration, Lord, guide them and give them wisdom as well. Um, Help us in our communities, Lord, display the courage like we should have as Christians and help us to love our neighbors. Help us to look for opportunities to serve and to just share the love of Christ with those who maybe have no hope, maybe they're feeling a little fearful. Well, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. We know that you are sovereign over all things. We love you, and we thank you for this day that you have made. Great is your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, open up your Bible to John chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians 15. And um, first of all, we're going to look at some historical events today that actually changed the hearts of men who were eyewitnesses of Jesus. And then these men went and changed the world, didn't they? Um, These written accounts found in Scripture could be referred to as impact events. And I submit to you that the resurrection of Jesus Christ, his ascending up into heaven, you can read about that in Acts chapter 1, Uh, Before their very eyes, mind you, and the triumphal entry into Jerusalem were three major events that were impactful in world history. So how do we know these things are true? First of all, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15 before we open up John chapter 12. And um, 1 Corinthians 15, let's look at the gospel. Let's open with that. Um, Paul writes, verse 3, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, meaning they were still alive. At that time, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me also. Verse 5, so important to recognize the importance of eyewitness testimony. He was he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures, verse 4, and that he was seen. 
That's one of the main reasons that the Jewish leaders and the Roman government at that time could not stop the way. This thing called Christianity that exploded, he was seen by hundreds, if not thousands, eventually. Um, Many convincing proofs, uh, Luke writes about that. Overwhelming evidence, including secular historians who wrote about the events surrounding Jesus and his disciples and the growth of Christianity, um, talk about fulfilled prophecies, and of course, all the eyewitnesses we already mentioned. But before we get into John 12, really important point, I found this to be fascinating. In this outstanding book called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, um, Dr. Frank Turek and Norman Geisler make a defense for the gospel, and there are some fascinating points in, um, by the way, I forgot to flip the the 1 Corinthians uh, slide up. There are some fascinating points in chapter 11. It's called The Top 10 Reasons We Know the New Testament Writers Told the Truth. Um, Virtually overnight, these Jews, except for Luke, but Luke wasn't there at that time, the Jewish disciples and all the, the followers of Jesus, virtually overnight, them and the writers of the New Testament specifically, abandoned many of their long-held sacred beliefs and practices. They adopted new ones. Not only abandoned the other ones, they adopted new practices, and they did not deny their testimony, even under threat of persecution and death. They did not deny their testimony. Something big must have happened. We'll get to that. But these are some of the 1,500-year-old institutions they gave up. Think about this. They were raised in this culture believing in Judaism. They knew the Old Testament scriptures, most of them, very well. So these are some of the things they gave up. The animal sacrifice system. In fact, I have a little... You can't see this, but I have a little note here. The animal sacrifice system, they replaced it forever by the one perfect sacrifice of Jesus. Next, the binding supremacy of the law of Moses. They saw its powerlessness because of the sinless life of Christ. Jesus fulfilled the law, right? And number three, they gave up strict monotheism. Um, Deuteronomy 6.4, what does it say? They had this memorized and down. They lived by this. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Their most cherished belief had been that, but they gave it up. And also, here's another interesting point, that man worship, to worship any man, has always or was always considered blasphemy and punishable by death. So they gave all these things up, right? What else? The Sabbath. Uh, They no longer observe it, even though they've always believed that breaking the Sabbath was punishable punishable by death. Also, belief in a conquering Messiah. They gave that up. Jesus was just the opposite at that time, wasn't he? He came in, which we'll get to in a minute, gentle, riding on a donkey. He loved, turned the other cheek. He was a sacrificial lamb, on his first visit. Now, when he returns, it'll be a very different story. We'll see a very different Jesus than what we saw here. So they gave up the idea of a conquering Messiah. So it's not just the New Testament writers um, who do this. Thousands of Jews, including some of the Pharisees at that time, if you go to Acts chapter 6, verse 7, they converted to Christianity. They joined the New Testament writers in abandoning these established treasured beliefs and practices. Wow! They wouldn't just do that for a rumor, right? Um, J.P. Moreland uh, helps us understand the magnitude of these devout Jews giving up their established institutions virtually overnight. Let me quote him right now. Listen. The Jewish people believed these institutions were entrusted to them by God. They believed that to abandon these institutions would be to risk their souls being damned to hell after death. Now, a rabbi named Jesus appears from a lower class region. He teaches for three years, gathers a following of lower and middle class people, gets in trouble with the authorities, and gets crucified. 30,000 other Jewish men were executed during this time period. 
But after five weeks, five weeks after he was crucified, over 10,000 Jews are following him and claiming that he is the initiator of a new religion. And get this, they're willing to give up or at least alter all five of the social institutions that they had been taught since childhood. Something really big was going on, wasn't it? So how do you explain the, these monumental shifts if the Bible isn't true? By the way, um, you can save a lot of time when you ask someone about you know, trying to t share the gospel. Say, do you believe, would you believe Christianity if it were true? If they say no, then move on. They don't want the truth. They don't, they're not open. But now, let me go, on, go to the next slide here. Not only do these new Christians at that time abandon their long held beliefs and practices, they also adopted some radical new ones. Sunday, to them, at that time, was a work day. Now, it's a new day of worship. Baptism. Baptism as a sign that one was a partaker of the new covenant, just as circumcision was a sign of the old covenant. The Trinity, as we mentioned, they gave up monotheism. The Trinity, believing God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In three persons, but one divine essence. And finally, think about this. They started communion, the Lord's Supper. What's that all about? This is especially inexplicable unless the resurrection and the Bible are true. Why would the Jews at that time make up a practice where they symbolically eat the body and drink the blood of Jesus? Why? How else could you explain this, such a monumental shift in Jewish thinking and practice? Well, an impact event or several impact events, like we mentioned at the top here. Um, something so dramatic that it changes either you, your life, or your surroundings forever. Let me ask you a question. Those of you that are old enough to answer this, do you remember what you were doing and where you were on September 11th, 2001? Yes, most of us know exactly when we heard the news that those planes flew in the Twin Towers in New York City, one into a field in Washington, one hit the Pentagon. We knew exactly what we were doing, possibly if you're having breakfast that day, what you were eating for breakfast when you found out that news. That's called an impact event. Now, there are very few events that all four gospel writers included, but they all provided details about the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. So open up your Bible to John chapter 12 now. And we'll review a little bit of history before we talk about his grand entrance. Just days before Passover and before entering Jerusalem, Jesus spent time with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha in Bethany. John chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he had, been, who, whom he had raised from the dead, there he made him a supper, or there they made him, Jesus, a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him the day before Passover. Think about this. Lazarus was in a tomb. Jesus raised him from the dead. That sign, that miracle, the news of that went out everywhere. It spread all around the region. And the Jews knew about it. So people are flocking to Bethany, I'm sorry, yeah, Bethany to see Lazarus. Um, <clears throat> go to now to verse 9, John chapter 12, verse 9. It says this. Let's see, do I have the right one up? Yes, not yet. We're not at verse 12 yet, but verse 9. Um, a gr now, a great many of the Jews knew that he was there. And he came, and they came there, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also. Verse 11, because 
on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. Think about their reaction to this now. So rather than give God glory and recognize this, this guy's raising people from the dead, as he did at least three times, um, instead of give God glory for this miraculous sign, what did they do? They plotted to kill Lazarus too. Boy, now we got to kill Lazarus because he's a, <laughs> an obvious reminder that Jesus did this miraculous sign. They're not looking at Jesus. Then they're, they're unwilling to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Let's kill Lazarus. It's almost unbelievable, that, but that's how blinded they were. So the very next day, Jesus would enter Jerusalem. Go to verse 12, John 12, 12. And then we'll read through verse 19. The next day, a great multitude had come to the feast. Multitude. Visitors from all over were coming to Jerusalem. When they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written. Now here's Zechariah 9.9. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb, eyewitnesses, right? Right there in verse 17. People were with him. They saw with their own eyes, when they were who were, they called Lazarus out of the tomb, Jesus did, and raised him from the dead, they bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard he had done this sign. Verse 19, the Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. And at that time, they were not exaggerating because there were people from all over visiting Jerusalem for Passover. So they're looking. The, by the way, I, I know I didn't get a, a picture up in time, but I don't know if you can see this. I'll show you where Jesus was. There's Bethany. There's where he was having that supper where people were coming to see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead, where Martha was serving. They were having supper there. And then this is, I know you might not be able to see this, For bear with me for a minute. This is the trail, the long trail, the path to Bethpage, which is here. And then from Bethpage, they have to go all the way toward the Mount of Olives. And then over right next to the Mount of Olives there, they have to go down into this valley, the Kidron Valley, before they get to the Eastern Gate. They're coming to Jerusalem on the east, which is significant and they make it to this, the wall, the city of Jerusalem, the eastern gate, and that's where Jesus entered the city. But he was on a donkey, evidently, all the way from here. So this narrow path, so a couple miles maybe, um, he was on the donkey, and the disciples were walking with him. The crowds were already preparing the way right there as he made his way all the way into the city, in the city gate of Jerusalem. I, I found that to be fascinating because the pictures we have of that time, well, we don't have pictures of that time or the video, right? They had bad video back then. Nothing's really clear. But no, we saw that every time they show something on a movie or an artist image, it's Jesus inside the city. Inside, there's walls, the city walls, so he's on the cement. That's not where this whole triumphal entry started. The entry wasn't an entry before Jesus had to make his way along this path. So I found that to be very interesting. So they were saying, look, it was like a parade route. <laughs> you guys all know, big Macy's Thanksgiving Day parade, Super Bowl parades, where when a team wins the championship, there's a parade route. So it's not just at the entrance of the uh, stadium or whatever. So this similarly wasn't just the entrance of Jerusalem at the Eastern Gate. They had to make their way there. 
Fascinating. Now, um, I'm going to read Luke 19, a couple verses. You don't have to turn there. I just want to read these verses to uh, Luke 19 talks about the triumphal entry and adds these details. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city, Jerusalem, and wept over it. And Jesus was saying to the city and the people, really, if you had known, even you, especially in this day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. Why? It tells us right here, Luke 19, 44. Because you did not know the time of your visitation. The utter destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. We, we see pictures of Jerusalem now. We just had a group from church go over to Israel a month or so ago. They saw the massive stones that had been thrown down when the city was demolished and destroyed in AD 70, 70 AD. That was God's judgment for their failure to recognize and receive Jesus as their Messiah. And that was about 35 years before it actually happened that Jesus predicted it. And a couple other portions in the Gospels, he mentioned that too, but the, it was utter destruction. So all this, Jesus coming into town, into Jerusalem, he had it all planned out before the Word became flesh, before he was even born, and before God allowed him to be born through Mary and given a human body. Jesus had it all planned out, and after 30 years on the earth, his time had come. He would now finally, on this triumphal entry into Jerusalem, finally, it was then that he allowed people to worship him. And you remember, I think it was also in Luke, that the uh, Pharisees said, uh, do you hear these people praising you, like worshiping you? Do you hear what they're saying? Save, son of David, save now, calling him the king of Israel. Jesus said, I tell you, if these don't worship, the stones will cry out. So he allowed people to worship for the very first time. Days before uh, he was arrested and crucified, he headed to Jerusalem as prophesied on a donkey. And his disciples, what were they doing on this whole long parade route, so to speak, through Bethany, Bethpage, Mount of Olives, Kidron Valley, and back up into the city gate in Jerusalem? They were basically doing crowd control, if you can imagine the chaotic scene. But they were celebrating. The people were shouting. As predicted, why? The king was coming. As predicted by the prophet Daniel, the exact day, of Jesus' grand entrance into Jerusalem. It was a very different scene at that time. Expectation filled the multitude during the Jewish feast of Passover as stories about Jesus had spread all over the land and possibly around the world at that time. Matthew quotes Zechariah 9.9, which we already uh, read, but here's a different translation of that. Rejoice greatly, Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus fulfilled this prophecy, which was a sign to all those who knew the Holy Scriptures, who knew the Old Testament, this was a sign. They knew about that prophecy, about the Messiah. The king was coming. Um, picture the scene, though. Doctor and gospel writer Luke explained that um, as Jesus approached the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd began to praise God, and he describes it two different ways, joyfully and with loud voices. Why? Luke tells us they were praising God for one reason, for all the miracles they saw Jesus do. 
eyewitnesses saw Jesus. The multitudes welcomed him. And when, when they were shouting out and celebrating and saying, Son of David, they were quoting Psalm 118, a messianic portion of the Psalms. And so they knew their scriptures. Listen to this. Psalm 118, 21 through 26. This is what they were shouting f- for the most part. This is the full text. I praise you for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of of the Lord. Psalm 118, 21 through 26. Remember when Jesus was born? We hear these scriptures quoted all the times around Christmas time. Remember the Magi when they came looking for the King of the Jews? Matthew records the fact that all Jerusalem at that time was troubled. They heard this news. What, these magi, these wise men, they're looking for the king of the Jews who had been born? So they were troubled. Matthew 2, verse 3. That sense of fear has now turned to anticipation and excitement 33 years later. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road uh, for Jesus to go over. Others cut palm branches down, put them in the road. Others were waving the palm branches. And Matthew wrote this in Matthew 21, uh, 9 through 11. Matthew 21, 9 through 11. Oh, there we go. And the crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred. All the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, better to be stirred than troubled, right? Um, But as we know from history, the jubilation didn't last because the mob shouting, Hosanna, Lord save, would cry out just days later, crucify him. Turn to, um, I do have the slide here for this one. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. Check out what the apostle John wrote in the book of Revelation about the future millennial kingdom following the great tribulation. Verse 9. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Revelation 7, 9, and 10. The Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. Do you believe him? The king had conquered. He had a mission to accomplish, which he did. Because remember, um, some of the last words of Jesus on the cross were, it is finished. The work that God sent him to do was complete. The writer of Hebrews put it this way in Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. It's encouragement for us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author, or another translation says the founder and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This 
is a God worthy of our worship, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. All others are counterfeits and copycats because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Make no mistake, all religious pathways do not lead to the living God and to heaven. Jesus is the way. So that impact event, the historic entrance into Jerusalem by Jesus through the eastern gate, which by the way, if you've seen pictures of it, it's cemented now. They walled that. It's the only gate that's closed, I believe, in Jerusalem because Muslim conquerors did that knowing that when the Messiah comes, they know our holy book, right? The Bible. When the Messiah comes, he's going to come through that eastern gate, it says, so they're going to cement it up and they put a cemetery in front of that gate <laughs> thinking that a, a holy man would not go through dead man's bones and they, he couldn't get through a cemented wall. Limiting God, right? That's what they did, though. Um, when he returns, though, the Bible tells us he, his feet will be at some point, whether he starts or whether he is there on the Mount of Olives. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives once again, and he will enter back through that eastern gate into the holy city of Jerusalem. Are you ready for the return of the king? Now, aren't you glad that Jesus was so determined and undaunted in his course to get to the cross? Think about this. Knowing that the Jews wanted to kill him, right? He entered Jerusalem in the most public way possible on a parade route, on a donkey. And they were shouting and praising him, knowing that the Jews wanted to arrest him and or kill him. He entered as kind of like royalty, right? A place of honor. He was coming in. He would rebuke Peter from trying to stop him. He would allow Judas to betray him. He would allow Mary to anoint him for burial And when he was arrested and abandoned by his followers, he strengthened himself in the Lord because he knew the cross had to come before the kingdom. So we are reminded, we were reminded at the beginning of this message, going back to um, 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel. It starts off with the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15. And It was very clearly proclaimed and believed at that time. So we know from Scripture, Jesus goes to the cross, which we'll talk about more next weekend, and he is returning to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. In this world, we will have trouble. But know this, Jesus overcame, and he said, I have overcome the world, he said. So, The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Coronavirus or not, Christians are not to grieve as those who have no hope, and we are not to fear or be afraid as those who have no Savior. To believers, Jesus said before he ascended the first time, he said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He is our hope. He is our peace. He is our salvation. And Romans uh, 10, 13 says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's why Jesus entered Jerusalem triumphantly. Thank God he did. Father, thank you for your word. Let it go from our heads down into our hearts that we may believe with all of our hearts We thank you that it's truth, and we thank you for so many convincing proofs that uh, we, we have trust in a loving, powerful, sovereign God, and we thank you for this time. Uh, protect the body of Christ, our congregation, and those saints across the country and around the world who are listening right now. I ask in Jesus' name that you would cover them, protect their families, keep them healthy, and uh, keep them shining the light of Christ into the darkness. Help us use this time 
as an opportunity, Lord, to bring others into the kingdom. Thank you for the salvation that we share. In Jesus' name, amen.